What's up, Military Millionaires? I'm your host, David Perret, and I'm here with my beautiful co-host, Alexander Felice, and the one and only Chris Perkins, who is a Marine Corps veteran who was in Ramadi and served as an artillery officer uh, in right next to where I was in Hawaii, and then got out and he worked in corporate finance with uh, Citibank, Lehman Brothers. He saw the 2008 crash, worked in uh, corporate finance for a long time, and then has recently got into the crypto space with uh, CoinFund.io and working with uh, veterans in crypto. And I'm going to mess this one up, veterans in digital finance, I believe. Um, And then He's just doing some really cool stuff in the innovative, uh, like digital finance space and crypto fin- uh, space. And so we're going to dig in because it's, it's a space that I don't really fully comprehend a lot of the really cool technological advances and things that are coming out in that finance space. And so when we were talking on the phone a couple of weeks ago, uh, I wanted to bring him on the podcast and dig into that because I think it's a cool space that a lot of people are interested in. And there's just not enough information out there yet as far as, um, you know, what's coming along in new advances. So Chris, thanks for joining us today, brother. Welcome to the Military Millionaire Podcast, where we teach service members, veterans, and their families how to build wealth through personal finance, entrepreneurship, and real estate investing. I'm your host, David Perret, and together with my co-host, Alex Felice, we're here to be your no BS guides along the most important mission you'll ever embark on, your finances. You're clear to depart friendly lines. Roger, Vic One, Oscar Mike. Hey guys, if you're looking to take your investing, business, life, or just yourself to the next level, then I have something for you. The War Room Real Estate Military Mastermind Group is a mastermind group that meets weekly in small groups of five to six people to help you hold yourself accountable and really experience that growth. But we also have a monthly guest speaker that we bring in, and we've had guest speakers that talk about mindfulness, taxes, We're bringing in somebody to talk about marketing. We bring in very specific topics that will adhere to very broad, any any kind of real estate investing or investing or entrepreneurship that you want to do, and we'll really help you out. We let you ask these speakers questions and get very personal with them. And then back to the small groups, weekly accountability for what you're trying to achieve and just being surrounded by like-minded people. And they say your network is your net worth. I know that's an overused phrase, but I recommend that you check it out. So just shoot an email to wrmastermind at gmail.com. Once again, that's wrmastermind at gmail.com. And we'll send you some more information. Thank you, David and Alex. Pleasure to be on, gentlemen. Absolutely. Why don't you uh, give the quick overview of your story? Sure. Uh, I grew up in, in God's country, a place called New Jersey, if you ever heard of it. Uh, from there, uh, I went to Annapolis and got a master's degree in Georgetown. And off I went into this crazy adventure we call the United States Marine Corps, um, which I loved every, every second of it. Uh, was commissioned uh, and, and then became an artilleryman. Uh, spent nine years in the Corps, first in Hawaii, then bounced around throughout Asia. And then 9-11 hit. Uh, and it was very frustrating for me because, you know, my family's from the New York city area. My sister was like literally impacted, uh, and treated at the towers. And like, there I was in Mount Fuji, Japan. Um, and so like, I knew I couldn't get out at that point. And then for me, it was a matter of like, how do I get, how do I get to the war? Like I'm a Marine. I deserve, like, my job is to fight. And it wasn't easy. Like I'd been in the fleet for a while and they tried to send me to Jackson, Mississippi. And I remember I was at this as a, as a, what we call expedition and warfare school. And I had to, uh, I tried to change orders. I know that doesn't happen, but I was able to find a guy who just had a baby. We had a few drinks and I convinced him to stay home with his daughter. And I, I was able to get to Camp Pendleton and off I went. Um, I was actually with, uh, I served under G- Jim Mattis, 1st Marine Division, uh, part of the Battle of Fallujah. We shaped it a little bit. Uh, and then I, I begged and pleaded to get down to the battalion and I, I joined 2-5 um, and and we tried to hold the city of Ramadi for those seven months. Um, incredibly challenging. This is 2004, 2005. So for the folks who are familiar with that era, it was, it was a tough fight. Um, unit probably took over 260 wounded, 15 KIA. Um, but God, it was an incredible experience. Um, and it was such an honor to serve in the Marine Corps uh, during that time. Um, you know, it, it was then when really had to really start understanding innovation, right? Because you're fighting an enemy that is a very difficult enemy to identify 
And, you know, I was an artilleryman with an infantry battalion, so I just couldn't go around blowing everything up um, because we were operating in a city. So I had to use my brain and really think through how I could leverage a lot of these things we would call non-kinetic effects. So the civil affairs team, how could we use information operations and other attachments that I had? How can I use them to get an effect on the battlefield? And like, how could I work to really win some of those hearts and minds of the local populace, the populace that, you know, we, it's hard for us to understand. So innovated so many different things, um, you know, learned a ton of lessons. I'll give you a quick story. Like one time, you know, I had unlimited money where I could find an Iraqi contractor and try to um, fund them. Um, but I, but every time we would we'd find an Iraqi contractor, they get killed, right? Their head, they would get their heads cut off and they would make a movie about it. Um, and so it was very hard. And finally, I found a guy, asked him to build a school. He built a beautiful school. Um, and of course, the day I paid him, it got blown to smithereens. And so you know, I don't know who blew up that school. I don't know if it was a terrorist. I don't know if it was him. He wanted more money. Um, so after that time, I was like, you know what, guys, like enough. Um, you're going to pave the roads. You're going to like clean up the garbage. So that's what's hitting us with IEDs. And so you're always having to think and try to outthink the enemy. Tough fight. Um, I transitioned from there. And uh, long story, I was going to stay in the government, but um, I met a woman um, who is now my wife. And uh, she, she was an investment banker. And she's like, look, why don't you like go down and meet that buddy of yours from 1-3 I know David, you're in Hawaii. So first time, third Marines, we served together. He had gone through business school and he had gotten a job in finance and he'd done it like the normal track. She's like, why don't you go down and, and talk to him? And I did. Uh, and like, you know, at that time in 2006, like finance was just going crazy. Like people were making all kinds of money. And um, one thing led to the next and got hired on the spot. Uh, and then I launched my, my, my career in finance. But maybe we'll pause there and, and we can pick up from there if you want. So there's there's a there's a trend that there's an interesting trend coming up that that I I think you know I'm on the cusp of this sort of you know timeline but and, and we're coming to it next is you went through 01 which was a very uh sort of divergent day uh 911 for American for you know Americans and then uh we're coming up to you said 06 and then so we're coming up to 08 which is another divergent day uh in our culture um, something that, you know, most of our listeners haven't been through either of them in any significant fashion. I barely went through them, to be honest. I mean, 01 sent me to war, but it was, I was 18. I, you know what I mean? Like I, it, it was a divergence, but it wasn't like that impactful. And then 08, I was in college. So I sort of felt the effects. It was like third order effects for me. It wasn't me losing a job or me losing a house. But you, you went through both of them sort of face first in that age where you, go through things face first, let's say. So I'm really curious. I'd like to hear the rest of the story, but then I'm really curious if in the back of your head, you can think of like, you know, nobody, if, if you, if you, if you're 20, I don't know what the age is. If you're, if you didn't own a house in 08, then you probably didn't go through um, either of these things. And so you haven't been through anything as traumatic since then. And I'm curious if you have some like advice for people to, because I, something, the next thing is going to happen eventually. Yeah, um, I'll tell you something, and I mean this strongly. The worst crisis, no matter how bad it is, it always gives you the best opportunities. I'm telling you, it does. Um, I left Iraq. It was a tough fight, right? But that Iraq gifted me with a couple of things that, that no one can ever take away. And probably the most important thing is perspective, right? I was with Pat Rapico the day he was killed, right? We had breakfast together. And, and I was there when he was killed and I was with him one second and the next second he wasn't there. Um, and so like when you step back and you think about that perspective, you know, I realized when I'm going to get back, I got to make a difference and I got to do it fast. Right. Because I don't know if I'm going to be here tomorrow. And it gave me this sense of perspective and almost this impatience um, that that helped me out. When when you go through like the financial crisis, terrible, terrible um, experience. And I'll, I'll give you like, you know, I, I went through the whole thing. I was sitting at the floor in Lehman Brothers running a derivatives business at the heart of the deriv uh, heart of the crisis. And so I watched billions of dollars blow up in front of my mind. But that terrible, terrible experience led to incredible opportunity because the next day my phone rang and they said, hey, do you want a job? And I said, it was Citigroup. I said, well, what kind of package do you have? And they said, well, it's an incredible package. It's called the job. And my wife was in mortgages, right? So she blew up, we blew up, 
you know, it left us in a pretty challenging position financially, as you can imagine. Um, so she's like, get down there. And then I showed up and at City, the, the whole thing almost almost happened again. But before I left Lehman, I had a client call me and he's like, hey, Chris, um, I got a big problem. And I said, well, what happened, man? And he said, I just wired, it was like $50 million or something to Lehman Brothers. And it was a mistake, right? And normally if you made uh, these mistakes, they happen, right? Like, and you find them, you decay them. But when you go bankrupt, typically if money goes in, it falls into a black hole and then they figure it out. I mean, they're still figuring out whose money is what in Lehman. Like it's like that bad, like literally they're still figuring it out. And so I, uh, I made some phone calls and I was just like, Hey guys, find that wire, decay it, decay it, which means get, you know, don't honor it, like cancel it. And they did. And so when I went across to my next firm, guess who my first client was? It was him because I saved his career. Right. And then the other thing that helped me, and I'm talking about opportunity, right. I had been in finance for two years. I was doing all right. Like I was growing my career, right? But I was much older and I had no experience, right? And so it was, and the thing about military is like you typically transition out. You have incredible experiences that they can't teach. And all the technical stuff was within your control, right? You can work your tail off, get up. And I did. First in the morning, like, you know, there at 5 a.m., studying, 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 last one to go because I can control how hard I work, right? So so, so that, that that's one of the that the legs up um, that we had. But anyway, so as I transitioned across, suddenly, like all these laws came out. In the United States, it was Dodd-Frank. Um, and I was in derivatives and we had, to, and the laws required us to take $700 trillion in derivatives from unregulated to regulated. And I looked around and I'd been in derivatives. There's nobody who had experience in this. Uh, and laws and regulations were coming out thousands and thousands of pages. And again, like, you know, who is going to run this thing? And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to read every page that comes out. I'm going to jump into the arena. And I did. I'm like, hey, guys, I, I want to run this business. And they're like, who the hell are you? I'm like, yeah, I just got here from Lehman. And, um, you, you know, I, I kind of understand this. And by the way, I've done the research now. I can talk to what's happening. Let me build this business. And they said, well, uh, we don't have anyone else to do it. So I guess so. And what happened there was an incredible level setting because nobody had experience in this new business. Um, and I was able to really jumpstart my career. You, you fast forward, you know, from there, we, we took that business, we grew it into a pretty, pretty big one. Um, you know, multi, multi-million dollar revenue, $40 billion in client money. And we were, we were successful and people thought nothing about city, but like, again, you go back to the Marine Corps lesson. What do you got to do? What's my mission? And then how am I going to build and task organize a team to accomplish that mission? And we did that. So we built the number one business in the world. Um, and then, you know, you, you start going along this path um, and building businesses and like um, got a tap on the shoulder 2018. And they're like, hey, uh, Chris, we want you to look at this business. And I said, OK. And I knew that that, that some of it was being run fast and loose. And um, it was one of the most complex challenges that I'd ever seen. Um, I was dealing with like, um, gosh, like five or six different jurisdictions, which led to like 12 regulators. And the day they appointed me to run that business was the day that Bloomberg reported a $180 million loss. It was called Foreign Exchange Prime Brokerage. So again, you're like, what do you do? You, you fall back on your team. You say, guys, this is the mission. We brought them all together. Uh, it's going to be hard, but we're going to muscle through this. And we cleaned it up, cleaned it up in nine months, 12 regulators later. Um, and then by the time I left traditional finance, I was running a uh, third business called our Global Futures business. Um, and futures, uh, if you don't know them, they're a super fascinating part of financial services. Uh, they actually started, you know, people will argue whether it's Chicago or, or Japan, but like really with agriculture. And it allowed farmers to hedge the forward um, pricing for, for their goods. Um, and, and those markets evolved in Chicago, New York and other places. And eventually we re realized that, wow, we can actually deliver financial products in the future. And so I was running those businesses. Um, but eventually I just couldn't stand it anymore. Um, and because I, I was so focused on innovation that um, I was pulled right back into crypto, which I've been looking at for years pre previously. Uh, I just want to make a mention that the guy who worked at Lehman Brothers in 08 said he went to work for a finance firm later that played flat, fast and loose. I thought that was uh, <laughs> that was a little no notable. Um, also, on your previous advice, I'm so sorry to cut you off. On your previous advice, um, you know, a quote that I live by, Sun Tzu said, uh, in the midst of chaos also lies opportunity. I think about that every day. 
And whether it's, you know, the military did the same thing for me, some of my mistakes in my previous life, um, catastrophe entered, uh, allowed me to become, you know, much more successful. So I do, I really like that advice, you know, adapt, uh, innovate. Yeah. Markets work in cycles, right? And you almost have to be a contrarian thinker when times are the worst, that's when the best buying opportunities are right. And pe- and, and that's why like people always get it backwards. They, they, they buy when things are hot and heavy and, but, but everything in this world cycles, like we're, we're in the midst of a bear market right now in the crypto industry, but gosh, the opportunity set is, um, is the biggest that I've seen. David, you got anything to add to my podcast? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just letting you go because, uh, you know, when we're talking about bear markets and crashes and, and 08. It's it's your world, man. You're a doom and gloom guy. <laughs> uh, I'm not doom and gloom. I'm contrarian. Everybody right now is super, uh, like you said, except for crypto. Um, and, you know, people are a little bit scared about the stock market. But in general, I think right now everybody's very, very, very confident, outstandingly confident. And, yeah, I'm like, oh, well, the end is near. And then when people... You know, I remember from 08 till about 2012, I couldn't have a single conversation. And maybe it's just the people I was around, but I couldn't have a single conversation with somebody without them complaining about the economy. And that lasted four years. And so now we're like in a technical recession and bear market and all these things. But nah, there's no pain. Nobody's sad or scared yet. So I remain uh, doom and gloom. And then when the when when things, you know, really hit the fan, I'm going to do exactly what Chris does. I'm like, the opportunity is abundant, you guys. Like, I'm so optimistic. Now is the time to strike. Chris, tell us about uh, your veterans in crypto. Yeah, well, it really starts with um, something called Veterans on Wall Street. And so, look, right after the crisis that Alex loves to talk about, um, the world came down on the banks and they really didn't like us. Um, I remember I was watching the Obama State of the Union address and I saw that Democrats and Republicans only agreed on two things. They thought that veterans were good and banks were really bad. This is right around 2008, 2009, right? And it's hard to get our our government to agree on anything, but they agreed on those two things. And I thought about my my own story. I'm like, gosh, like finance has provided me a lot of opportunity. And after all the excesses that we saw, I'm guessing that more veterans in our space would do the finance industry a lot of good. So let's bring veterans onto Wall Street, right? And, And I think it would be good for vets and I think it would be good for Wall Street. And so um, we met, we brought together all of our peers, all of like, you know, we, we would never like cooperate with, uh, with our, with our com- competition, like the other banks, but we brought them all together. We went to City Field. We said, guys, let's share best practices. And this thing called uh, Veterans on Wall Street was born or vows. Didn't love the name. Couldn't think of anything better. That was Deutsche Bank's name. Um, we said, all right, we'll use the name. Uh, and then this incredible thing happened where, over the next 10, 10 years, we raised $15 million uh, for vets. We had an annual symposium. Uh, we continue to do it. Uh, there's a guy named Diego Rubio who's looking after it now from Wells Fargo. We were able to extend our membership to like a couple hundred firms, uh, banks, and we were able to touch, I think, thousands of people. We would have annual symposiums. We'd have standing members of, of cabinet members and secretaries of, of various services come in. Uh, we would really train. What we'd do is we'd bring vets in in the morning. And we bring hiring managers in the afternoon so we could teach both sides how to, how to get jobs and how to have, find careers. Um, so that was an awesome, awesome initiative. We had a great partnership with the Bob Witter Foundation on that. Um, and so when I left finance behind, I knew that we had a really good model. And again, like the crypto industry, love it to death. Uh, but my thesis is, is that if we could have more veterans in the space, again, there's incredible opportunity. It's good for crypto. It's good for vets. And so um, got together with a couple of buddies and we launched something called Veterans and Digital Assets or VITA, which also means life. Um, we have a Discord. I'd love to give you give you the, the, the contact for the Discord. Uh, we, we want more community members to come involved. And I think we've got around 500 community members. And the greatest thing about this, and it's in keeping with the crypto ethos, is it's decentralized, right? I'm not the boss of it. I'm not in charge of it. I don't want to be. I want the community to drive it. And it's doing just that. It's been fascinating and, and so happy. Like it's been evolving so magically. So a bunch of community members got together. They're like, hey, we're going to start some in real life events. Uh, they hosted one in San Diego. We just had one in D.C. And again, like really touching folks' lives, touching veterans' lives. 
um, by helping them identi identify opportunities in Web3, which has just been fantastic. So, and like what people don't get is that if you're a veteran and you want to get into this thing we called Web3, and I can describe what, what I mean by Web3 here in a second, but there are jobs everywhere, everywhere. My company alone, we're a venture capital firm. Uh, we have portfolio companies. There are hundreds and hundreds of jobs that we're looking to hire for within our portfolio. Not all of them have to be, you know, engineers and computer scientists. There's plenty of them that are that are non-technical. So um, that's something that we thought we could make a big difference. And so we, we launched Vita. And uh, I also have, you know, I don't want to compete with you guys, but I have a small podcast uh, called the Vedic Podcast that we do where we feature prominent veterans in the space, um, which is which has been a lot of fun. Uh, Dave and I haven't been on it. Well, let's get you the crypto. Could... Let's get you the crypto, <laughs> then you come on to my podcast. Yeah, I don't think I could speak articulately about anything that that podcast covers. Uh, but if you get us that Discord link, we will absolutely drop it in the show notes for the show. That. I appreciate that. I would like that. to give a shout out to one of our listeners, a guy named Austin Clark. He is a young fella, military, real ambitious, doing real well on YouTube. So he's got like a, a brand identity that's growing and he is hard on crypto and he's learning a lot, spending a lot of time in it. So maybe he's somebody I can introduce you to. Um, I would love it. Let's get you on the podcast and, and uh, let's, I'd love the help. Love that. Yeah, his channel has grown real quick. He's up to 11,700 subscribers as of right now. He was uh, he did a Skillbridge internship for me for uh, five months on his last five months in the army. And when he started that internship, he was under a thousand subscribers, and that started in October. So in a year, he's almost half of my subscribers in the last four years. So yeah, he's. He's doing really well because he he's, he's he had a, a crypto guy. video take off and he was like, I'm going to just lay into crypto and it's done very well for him. Cool kid. So what is um, tell me about the crypto like we're, we're mostly real estate investors. Uh, I know you're you're into, you know, DeFi, but to, can you do you have any interesting examples about something that's maybe pragmatic about crypto besides the um, I don't think, you know, certainly David or I, I, I wouldn't say are very interested in um, buy, you know, the total model of crypto as a as an investment vehicle but we both i would i can't speak for david but would both probably agree that there's a huge crypto space coming i just don't know what it looks like so can you give it's us some gonna, insight into that i think this it's absolutely going to erase title companies i give it that yeah for sure i'm so glad you brought that up because that's where i was going to start um and this well, is that's this my favorite part, example this is a part of the podcast where i try to red pill you guys um so what is crypto? I, I like to start by thinking about it at a very big level. And I think this is going to be bigger than anything that, that we really can, we're really imagining right now. The central ledger, the, the ledger itself, right? That was started actually 7,000 years ago where I fought in Mesopotamia, right? And 7,000 years ago, they came up with this thing called the ledger. They said, okay, who owns what? Who, what are the liabilities? What are the assets? And where's title sit, right? That was 7,000 years ago. Guess what? If you study history, what part of the world flourished in art, science, mathematics, et cetera, it was that part of the world that that led the world for, for, for centuries. Right. And I would argue that it probably had something to do with the establishment of that ledger, which sits not only at the heart of the economy, but I would argue at the heart of civilization. Who owns what? Right. Second innovation happened in. Yes, sir. Have you read David Graeber's um, debt the first 5000 years? No, maybe I should. You'd like it. And he starts with the whole premise about that is who owns who, who, who owes what to who. Right. But it's a big deal. And that's how it's a very big deal. That's what makes civilization go around. Second innovation to the ledger happened in the Renaissance with double entry bookkeeping. Uh, and then in 2008, we had a pretty material change to the ledger itself. Why? Because we were able to have this thing called the blockchain, which allows for the trustless, permissionless exchange of title. That's the fundamental innovation that we're seeing. And yeah, it started with Bitcoin. Um, look, when people say, I like, the I like the blockchain, I don't like crypto, that's not really true because the two go hand in hand. Um, and then Ethereum came out in 2014 and 2015 and, and really introduced these things called smart contracts. So if A equals B, then C, and you can actually start exchanging value. What Web3 is, is it allows you to take value, something, 
you can take that that value that that digital that asset any asset you can put it in the internet and and you can it actually it will keep its value because you can identify title and change title uh, within the internet and if we start thinking about um, our lives right I probably spend I don't know sixty percent of my waking moments on the internet my kids would spend probably ninety percent if I let them but we're spending more and more time on the internet interfacing. Um, and like, when I think of the metaverse itself, I'm not thinking of like VR or whatever. I'm thinking about the time that I'm interfacing in, in the interface in the internet. But anyway, we're allowed to now introduce value into the internet. And if you think about it in, in web two, the only thing you could kind of own is your domain name. Now, when you think about the evolution of the web, it's very much like the evolution of civilization. So in the beginning, right, we had hunters and gatherers. I know you guys are a little bit younger, but when I was in college and I touched the internet for the first time, totally clunky, like I had to log on my server. It wasn't organized. Hunters, gatherers, right, very disorganized. And then all of a sudden, uh, we graduate to Web 2, which is like sovereigns, monarchies, right, where, where they allow us, they give us like the ability to feed into this innately tribal desire to form groups. Um, but in the case of Web 2, like we're, you know, we're farming the land and all of our data is going up to, to and all the economics serve a couple of guys who run the Internet. Literally, they all get it. It's all centralized. With Web 3, we allow this concept. We build on this concept and we actually introduce democracy. And why is that? Because we, we allow these communities to form, but we also allow them to issue tokens and raise funds to raise a treasury. And then based on their ideals, they can vote to deploy their assets in accordance with that ideal. So a good, a good um, if you learn anything from this podcast, look up the word DAO, Decentralized Autonomous Organization. A good example of this is the Constitution DAO. And so what happened here? In a period of five days, 17,500 people. And by the way, in crypto, everything we do is instantaneously global. There are no national borders because it's the internet, right? So 17,500 wallets came together and they raised $50 million in five days with the express purpose of buying the U.S. Constitution. It's called the Constitution now. And they failed. Um, Ken Griffin came in and bought it for like you know, 52 or something like that. I'm sure someone will correct me, but, but they, they, they lost the, the auction. But it really showed the power of this technology. And this is just like we're so early right now, but... You know, David, you said title, right? Like, wh why do we like have, like, like we have blockchains now? And and one of the challenges people are always like, oh, it's so nefarious, this and that. The the Web three, the blockchain is almost too transparent in many cases, right? Where you know you can put all those public records on chain. Um, it's going to take some time and effort, but we all know where the world is going, and that's just one small example. Anything that has title can be tracked, um, and it can be put on the blockchain. Title companies are the, just so archaic. They're the worst. It's like, how do I ha how do I have title issues? Like, how do you not know what happened with this house? Like, I, I don't I don't get it. You know how do how do I get in how do I get involved besides buying Ethereum on Robinhood? What I recommend is if you want to learn about crypto, and again, like, I'm not trying to don't put your life savings into this. Um, you have to, you know, you have to do your own research and I'm not giving investment advice whatsoever, but the way to truly appreciate the technology is to like take a very small nominal amount of, of tokens. Um, you know, you onboard via an exchange, it's called an on-ramp. Then you move it into a non-custodial wallet, something like a, like a MetaMask. And then from there, and it's a bit clunky, you watch a couple of YouTube videos, but then you can start moving your, your, moving these assets through Web3. You can learn how to borrow. You can learn how to lend on certain DeFi protocols. You can go and buy an NFT um, as an example, and you can start tasting the, the, the technology and what it can do. Um, and you see really quickly, like, you can settle funds with anybody in the world instantaneously, you know, rather than, you know, go through an intermediary, wait for the bank to open and fill out a form, et cetera. Um, so I, I, my, my recommendation is if somebody's interested in this, like touch it and feel it, test the technology. There are a ton of um, podcasts that are out there. Um, generally, most information comes via Twitter and then Discord. And I know that many people across the web, Web3, are trying to say, well, why are we using these Web2 platforms? Um, look, that, that's just how the information is flowing today. I'm sure it'll there's, there's new like Web3 social media coming out and something called like Lens Protocol as an example. So 
a lot of stuff's happening, but my recommendation would be to do to, to touch it and feel it. You know, you can go on Twitter, you can go on to Discord and start learning about communities. But but you know, be careful about what you speculate. You know, to all the all the military vets, um, educate yourself before you before you go crazy. So you're you're saying that buying gorillas on boats is not necessarily the best way to get started. Depends on the gorilla. Um, it depends on the rarity, but. Um, We'll get into that maybe in the next episode. I do like NFTs, sucker for them. Um, the thing about NFTs is this, right? And a lot of people don't understand this. You're not just buying a JPEG, right? Think about it. You know, you want to join the country club down the street. How many people could join that country club? Well, they probably need to be within at a maximum 30 miles, 40 miles, right? They have to have a certain amount of, of I don't know, money or whatever to, to meet that membership. So it's very limited. Only a certain number of people can do it. In crypto, everything's instantaneously global. If you have a 10K, a lot of these um, NFT um, series, they're, they're, they're 10K, right? A lot of people buy more than one. So maybe there's 5,000 in circulation in the entire world. To the extent that that NFT collection has certain values or certain community traits, now, if you identify with that, you know, you're one of a club of 5,000 people in the world. Maybe there's something to that. Um, but again, a lot of them are, are, you know, not worth what they should be. Some maybe are. Um, but, but that's when you think about NFTs, think about community. And that's just the first iteration. You, know, you can take anything in the world and make it non-fungible and put it in the, in the Internet for value with this technology. And so I think over time, you're going to see a lot more utility um, with those NFTs. And like you're already seeing with many brands, like, Hey, um, if you have an Adidas NFT, then you can, you'll get certain merch, uh, for, 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 for holding on to that or et cetera. So like, look, the other thing to think about, right? Bitcoin's been around since 2008. Okay. Not that old Ethereum, 2014, 2015, not that old. Almost all the stuff that we look at is less than five years old. Like, think about that. It's early. Uh, I just want to point out that Netflix and Bitcoin came out around the same time and Bitcoin has not done nearly what Netflix has done. Just just throwing that out there to, to just for antagonist's sake. Um, <laughs> um, the, uh, the thing about Bitcoin, uh, blockchain that really intrigues me is that for the first time, we're going to have scarcity on the Internet. And that really that really excites me because right now it feels like, uh, you know, it's just it's a wild west in terms of ownership. Yeah, look, I think that's why some people are attracted to Bitcoin because it's, you know, it'll ultimately only be 21 million coins. And so there is scarcity value there. Um, but, but you're right. There, there's scarcity. We can introduce scarcity as we introduce value with Web3. And I, I may challenge you on the Netflix uh, analogy. No, I mean, I, I'm curious. I, I, I thought of something completely different. You have something that revolutionized, like we talked about, the entire monetary system. And you think that that's less, uh, that that's made less of an impact than, than, um, Netflix. I love Netflix as much as the next guy, but um, I'm not sure I agree with you. Yeah, um, I think in terms of retail user, um, like in terms of like retail users, I think more people use Netflix than they do Bitcoin. Bitcoin's going to have a or blockchain certainly. Crypto's going to have a larger impact in the long run. I actually think Netflix is going to die um, over the long run. But it's been interesting just to watch, you know, from a just from a narrative standpoint, not not from a technical standpoint because I don't know the technical in 2008 Bitcoin was created as an answer to the unreliability of the fed to the, the poor, the poor decisions of the centralized, you know, federal reserve. And it was hailed as like the future. And then here we are, you know, quite a few years later and it, it's still in a, let's say a weird state. Nobody, I don't want to say nobody. I don't really know what it's going to be or how to use it. I don't use it. You know, people buy into it. There's a lot of mania that surrounds it. But Netflix, I mean, millions and millions and millions. And I don't know how many subscribers they have. A lot more people in America use Netflix on a daily basis than they need Bitcoin, which was surprising to me. Yeah, I think there's a utility discussion to be had over Bitcoin, but it, it, is, it, it has demonstrated to be a store of value. Um, you know, and it's also one of the, the better performing financial assets in, 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 in the last many years so. Um, and I think I think it's an important debate to be had, but I, I do think that the technology that we talked about uh, is here to stay. I think you're going to see it continue to grow. Here's the other thing that you're going to see. Um, look, when I was 
back in the 90s, you had all these dot-com companies start popping up, right? Guess what? Every company is a dot-com company now. Every last one, right? Um, right now, we have a bunch of crypto companies popping up. Guess what? Every company is going to be a crypto company in a few years. And so um, that's how I think about it, at least. That's kind of been my prediction for the last, you know, probably year and a half is maybe maybe two years is that I think crypto is going to kind of be uh, like the dot com bubble where it'll it'll go through a phase where crypto itself is absolutely around to stay. But I, I, I would imagine that probably a large majority of the exists, maybe not a large majority, but a, a good chunk of the coins that are in existence right now, maybe won't. Um, you know, I can't imagine that uh, come rocket is a enduring uh, a coin per se, but um, the technology, absolutely, right? So I wonder, I wonder if it's going to go through a phase kind of like the dot com bubble where a lot of companies disappeared and then it came back as, you know, a, the what we know now. I don't know, but. No, I think that I think that's right. I, I don't think, like I said, the uh, what you're seeing now is going to be the final end state here. I think over time, every company is going to be a Web three company. I was, I guess, I, so I don't know enough about the Web three world, but I saw at one point that uh, people were talking about buying uh, your domain as like a dot ETH. Um, do you, does it make sense to go and like start buying your domains as dot something other than dot com at this point? Or I don't know how that would work as far as if there's something I could do to start preparing for the Web3 world. Great. Um, that's a great question. So what you're talking about are ENS domains. And to your point, you know, if you have an ordinary wallet, there's a whole ton of different characters what you can do is you can go in and it's a neat little website. You type in the ENS domain that you want. So like david.eth, you know, that one's taken, sorry. Um, but you'll immediately find out if you own it or not. And if, if somebody doesn't own it, you can buy it, right? And you can buy it for a period of time. Um, then what you can do is you can link your non-custodial wallet to that uh, ENS address. And so rather than typing in that entire string of characters, you just can type in, you know, david.eth as an example in this case, uh, and and the assets could be directed to that wallet. So it really makes things much more simple when you're when you're moving assets through the system. Um, and it's kind of cool. They do trade because um, you own them, right? And some of them trade for a lot of money. Um, and you can go into a marketplace and say, hey, I have this name. Does anybody want it? And that's a very vibrant market. There, there are other protocols out there, um, like unstoppable domains, and so these are other. There are other folks out there, but the the ENS domain is 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 the primary one for the Ethereum ecosystem, and uh, yeah, it's it's very very popular in our space. Time to start buying up domains that I will want in the future. People did start that buying. in the uh, in two thousand and in the early two thousands. They said uh, all these domains are gonna it's gonna be scarce, so buy them all up. And it's interesting because to your early analogy, like that didn't work out. The domains as an investment of scarcity didn't really work out, but now everybody has a domain. Like everybody still needs an internet website. So it's really interesting how things sort of evolve adjacent sometimes to what you think. You never know. Uh, my, my uncle's got a really good friend who uh, he has a website. Uh, he owns a company in, in Northern California uh, that delivers uh, 420 friendly products and his, his, his domain is bud.com and uh, he likes his company, but for years he's been joking that if he would just accept Budweiser's offer, he could retire. Uh, but he refuses to accept their offer because he likes his company. So you, you never know, uh, you know, but I don't think that's a domain I'm going to buy. What I'm going to try to do, the guy who owns militarymillionaire.com is salty and refuses to sell it, but won't do anything with it. So I'm going to go buy the stupid ETH domain so he can't get it. <laughs> what I'm what I'm actually working on is trademarking it so that when he does get does finally do the domain, I can be like, "Screw you, buddy! That's trademarked." Because <laughs> he's he, he's owned it for like ten years and never done anything with it, and I've tried to buy it from him. He, he doesn't even want an offer. <clears throat> what do we miss, Chris? Anything we missed that we need to touch on before you get to your meeting? No. Um, look, 
one of the things that I've always tried to do is give back um, to the community. And so um, would love for people to join us uh, into the interview to discord community is awesome. They're really smart. They know crypto really well. So if you have any questions around any of the stuff, uh, there are people on there that are a lot smarter than me and they can, uh, they'll help educate you. And it's nice to be part of a community of veterans. We also welcome non-veterans obviously to help us out. Some of, in my experience, a lot of the folks who never served are some of the best supporters out there. And so, uh, Love what you guys are doing. Thanks for looking after the community, and uh, it's been great to be on. No, thanks for joining us, brother. I've appreciated a uh, chance to talk about something other than real estate, and it's always uh, fun to talk to another vet. We didn't talk about digital real estate, though. We missed that one. Can we? Hit, can you hit it in sixty seconds? No, I, I uh, look. I'm, I'm no expert on that, but there, there, we have, we do have digital uh, real estate. Like if you go into Sandbox, as an example. I think similar concepts apply, maybe not identical, but like scarcity value, like where are you located? And those are all things that are being factored. You know, I think it's taken a hit recently and people are like, oh, this is just not real. Like it's, but I always go back to, you know, what I talked about earlier is like, we spend so much of our time on the internet. Um, so you have to think about how you want to exist and present yourself and where you want to live there. So I don't know, it's super early, but, but we do have, you know, there's emerging real estate markets in Web3. I believe in that. I don't know what to do with it. I, have, I don't want to buy a house in a world that disappears, but I, it's coming. <laughs> I've got like $1,500 in one of the games. I forget which one, but I was putzing around on it when it first came out. I was bored. It's your closet DJ in there, David. I love it. <laughs> you can tell how invested I am because I can't remember the name of the app. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Yeah, I lost my house. Ever. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's cash flowing, but I haven't collected any rent because I haven't gone on the app in probably three months. So it's just sitting there. So for all I know, the tenants have been evicted and the house is burned down. But, you know, I still own it. Probably going to go with tax auction soon. There you go. <laughs> Chris, this was fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, thanks fun. for joining us, yes, brother. We'll do it again soon. Thank you for listening to another episode about my journey from military to millionaire. If you liked it, be sure to visit from military to millionaire.com slash podcast to subscribe to future podcasts. While you're there, we'd love for you to rate the show. Give us a review on iTunes. Now get out there and take action.